April. What are we talking about today? We can talk about evaluations. Cool. Uh... Fact. <laughs> it is a fantastic presentation. Why should we care about research and evaluation? Um, so there are various methods that we're going to talk about today. So it's not just randomized control trials, which is what the A to J lab specializes in, but there are certainly other types of methodologies out there um, that can be utilized. And why should we use, utilize them? Which ones should we utilize? It's kind of a, there's a big question out there of which evaluation method is most, most appropriate. So we're going to talk about those today, and some of these are things that um, you might need to partner with a research institution to do, or you might need to hire a consultant to do, but some of these are things that you can do um, in your own organization with the tools and the resources that you have. So we'll talk about those aspects as well. Um, and we'll talk about like where you can find some of the helpful resources to do these evaluations on your own. Okay, so why care about research in the law specifically? Um, I think a lot of these points that are, are things that all of you are well aware of, there's a huge need for civil legal services. Um, so, so funding is a problem across the board. Courts are having funding crises all the time. Um, and there are a number of courts that are even closing on certain days to conserve resources. This is a huge problem, especially with the, the rise of self-represented litigants. Um, there's statistics out there that 85% of the people with civil legal issues are not represented. Um, legal service providers turn down one out of every two who request resources and help. Um, only half of, of attorneys do pro bono. And, um, and then uh, of course there's Becky Sanifer's research on how and whether people identify their problems as being legal in nature and showing that a lot of people don't even identify that they have a legal problem in the first place, so they're not reaching out for help. Um, and most importantly, we don't really know everything right now. So we, we don't know what works best and what doesn't. Um, we don't exactly know how the system works such that they're you know, identifying certain leverage points to improve the process and make it more efficient. Um, that's information we don't have. Um, and we don't have information on what criteria we should be using to select clients and help the most people. Um, the other day, uh, I was on a, a conference call and Jim Greiner described something that I, I thought was a really effective way of putting this. He said, um, imagine the party our clients would throw if, we, if our resources got doubled. Um, and then imagine the party our clients would throw if we became twice as effective. So that's what research and evaluation can kind of help us do. It's really improving the process and being becoming more effective so that we can serve more people. Well said. <laughs> okay, so this this slide is a little bit of a joke. Uh, I mean, it's it's there's some truth to it, but it's a little bit of an extreme example. But um, in the medical profession, uh, we're really familiar with the fact that that research is integral to the process. So any drug that's on the market. Um, has gone through many phases of rigorous evaluation before it makes it out into the market. Um, and, and tons of these don't make it through this evaluation process. Um, in the law, I know we do do some evaluation, so this is a little bit of a, a joke to, to get at the idea that pretty much what we're doing is coming up with ideas, a lot of great ideas out there, um, but rather than, than pausing and testing out those ideas, we just put them in the field. Um, and so what we could and should be doing is in this phase here, uh, testing out some of the ideas to see which which are the best ideas that have the most the, the best effect, but also are there ways to tweak those ideas that we have to be more effective? Um, are we targeting the right kinds of people with those ideas? Um, so this that's this phase right here um, is where you really want to think about doing some research and evaluation, and not just right there, but things that are already in the field you can test as well to to make changes to them, to, to, to implement changes, to be more effective. So um, 
So that's just a, a brief overview of what we could and should be doing in the law. And a lot of funders are starting to require that you have the ability to show that a, a program is actually being effective. And so this is this coming into the law um, in the near future. And, and for groups like LSC, they've already started mandating uh, outcome requirements. Okay, so we're gonna go over some research questions that you might have um, and talk about what evaluation or research methodologies are most appropriate for those questions. Um, and we'll go through them kind of one at a time. Okay, so this is a overview of the different kinds of questions that you might ask and a description using some annoying jargon of the type of evaluation that you might think of to use to answer that question. So all the way over here by Matthew, um, you might ask, what is known about the landscape within which your program operates? Um, I don't know why there are two question marks there. A really <laughs> exciting question. Um, so you might ask that question, and that would lend itself to a formative assessment. We'll talk about what these things mean. Um, a second question you might ask is, does the program operate the way it was intended to operate? So another way of saying that is, is it working the way you planned on it working? Is it are there any uh, quirks in the process that you didn't anticipate or you're not seeing? Um, so those are good things to know as well. Uh, another question you might ask is, is the program cost effective and sustainable? Certainly a question you're gonna wanna answer for getting more funding. Um, if you've had a change in the funding, you wanna know uh, how that might affect the program's operations. Um, Another question you might ask is, is my program associated with positive outcomes for clients? And I've kind of italicized the word associated um, for, for a reason. Uh, and then the next question you might ask is, does the program cause positive outcomes for clients? Again, italicized, because those are really two different questions that have different methodologies for addressing them. And you don't have to pick just one. Uh, you can do multiples of these. You can start with one, move on to the next one. Um, so don't just try to be boxed in by just one. So Matthew already anticipated some of this, but first of all, um, know what question you're trying to answer. Uh, so being really clear about what the question is in the first place is going to help you figure out what methodology you should use. Okay, this is what Matthew is saying. Okay. Consider more than one type of evaluation. So you don't have to use just one. In fact, we're gonna recommend that you use different types of evaluation um, in combination, but also at different points in your program's development might lend themselves to different questions and different types of evaluation. Um, so when you're coming up with an evaluation plan, which should happen um, early on, uh, you might wanna consider different types of evaluation in combination. Um, and then be aware of the limitations of each approach. So this is another thing we're gonna talk about today. Each methodology has its own limitations. It has its strengths and it has its limitations. Um, and one, one way I like to think about this is you can imagine a methodology as being like a flashlight and you're, and, and you're shining the flashlight at a, a visual representation of, of your project and the world and just you know, what, your, what, what your program is trying to do. And each methodology is going to shine the light in a certain way. Some are gonna be very narrowly focused but bright. Some are gonna be very diffuse. Um, and so knowing what those boundaries of that light that's shining um, are is going to be really important. And then also to kind of reiterate the use of more than one type of evaluation. If you have multiple different kinds of flashlights shining, you're going to get more light um, on, on the thing that you're trying to examine and you'll be able to see more. Okay, plan your evaluation as early as possible. This is something we run into um, all the time in talking to field partners. Um, people will get an idea as we do and, and throw it into the field as we do in the law and then six months later maybe a funder will ask for some information and they'll they'll then consider evaluation they'll say okay now we have to show that this program that we've had in operation for the last six months is working um, but if you think of it then you won't have collected the data that you need to analyze it to show that it's working so thinking about your evaluation as you're rolling out a new program or as early on as possible is going to help make sure that you are 
documenting things in a way that will then lend themselves to an analysis later so that you can get back to your funder about what was working, but also so you can get back to your own program about what's working so you can tweak it and, and make changes. And then also thinking about um, how things are changing in the world so that you can kind of keep touching base with like, what are the trends in your client population? Are there like things that are changing in your environment that might affect how effective your program is? Um, so you just want to make sure you're documenting these things and keeping that in mind and able to analyze that later on. So those are the big takeaways to think about throughout this conversation that we're having. And defining an outcome can be really important too defining what success looks like as well. And you have to think about those before the project goes into uh, effect and not six months down the road. Okay, so this is the first type of assessment that we're gonna talk about. Um, the jargony term is formative assessment. Uh, this is to address the question of what is, what is happening in the landscape within which your program is operating. So by landscape, I mean a number of things. We could be talking about your population demographics, uh, so that's your, your client, um, your client population. Uh, you could be talking about what their needs are, what is going on with um, access to the services in your jurisdiction, what is kind of the like technical infrastructure in your jurisdiction, um, laws and policies. I mean, all these sorts of things are like really big picture, landscaped, landscape kinds of questions that are important to know if you're going to introduce a program to an environment. Um, so this is a you can look at data in a number of different ways to get at this. So you can look at, you can have focus groups, you can have, um, do interviews with your client population, direct observation of what's happening, analysis of program data, uh, and analysis of external data sets as well. Um, and this will be great in just describing that landscape, um, understanding if there have been changes. So if you had a program that you implemented five years ago, you might wanna check in with what's happening with your client population um, to find out if there are any changes. Um, and then as far as the limitations go, this methodology, it really is just gonna describe what's happening. It's really gonna look at a kind of a snapshot, snapshot of a description of what's happening out there, um, but it won't tell you if your program is making a change or having an impact on the client base. So let's think of some examples about this. Um, Matthew, do you have any examples of a formative assessment? Yeah, so some broad examples here, especially with this quantitative approach here is more and more courts and cities are putting their data online and, and, uh, and an ability to analyze it a lot easier than it was five, 10 years ago. And with different kind of tools like web scraping, uh, you're actually able to scrape a lot of this information into uh, an Excel sheet or something else that you might be able to analyze. And one great area for this is uh, criminal record expungement. So a lot of groups are moving into criminal records ex expungements as the laws change and allow it to become more easy. Uh, and a lot of times people don't have any idea as to how many cases or people have an eligible case for expungement. How many expungements are being granted every year? Uh, and it's really critical to have those numbers in place in order to make sure that your program is uh, attacking the problem at the right roots. Uh, and so before you start, uh, as you're doing this formative assessment, definitely take a look online and see what data sets are available, what may have been uh, put on just recently and what data sets can you combine to get a better sense of what the problem looks like? Yeah, and um, the US Census data can be really helpful, and that's something that um, is just, it's publicly accessible. You don't need to be an expert web scraper because it's actually made in a fairly accessible way online. Um, that can tell you a lot about your, the demographics of your population. Um, there are also organizations that do surveys of populations out there. So for example, there are periodic surveys of technology access. So if you're gonna implement a new tech tool, um, it's really important to know what kind of access your client population has to that technology. Um, another thing you might wanna know is where, where are all your clients? So where is your poverty population and where are um, the various types of services? So where are your pro bono attorneys? Where are your legal service providers? Where are all of your self-help centers out there? Um, and where are identifying where those gaps are? So you can then do targeted outreach. Um, all of that would be within the umbrella of formative assessment to just kind of understand the landscape within which you can implement a program. That's gonna be something that funders are gonna wanna know if you're, if you're posing, you know, proposing some kind of study that, said, that claims 
that there's a need for, for example, a rural self-help center or some kind of tech outreach to rural areas, it can be really important to demonstrate like numbers, like who, who are you reaching? Um, how many people are you gonna be able to reach? What is the, the gap in, um, in services and access to services there? Uh, does the program that you're proposing, um, is it delivering services in a way that is going to be accessible to that particular population? Um, okay, I think we've covered that well enough. So the next type of evaluation we're gonna talk about is process evaluation. This is, you might ask the question, um, does this project or program or new technology tool that I've developed operate the way I think it's operating? So we're not quite getting at the idea of is it causing positive outcomes for your clients, but like, is it just working the way you think it's working? Um, was it implemented the way you've designed for it to be implemented? Are um, your staff carrying it out the way they were trained to carry it out? Those kinds of questions. Um, and then as far as the methods, interviews with your program staff, direct observation, um, client surveys, staff surveys, these are all approaches you can take. Um, and then analysis of administrative data, uh, which could include if you're doing some kind of tech thing, I mean, I'm gonna leave it to Matthew to explain those, uh, those um, examples, but if you've got some kind of tech tool, there are probably analytics behind that tech tool that you can examine to see if it's, if it's working the way you think it is. Um, and so that's really, again, a, a necessary step if you've designed something and you just wanna, you, you need to test out whether it's, it's operating the way it's supposed to. As far as limitations, again, we're talking about something that is pretty much just descriptive. It's, you know, is it working? Is it running smoothly? Um, but it's not gonna tell you yet, like, is it causing positive outcomes out there in the world? Is it affecting people's lives? Um, example, do you have an example? Yeah, yeah, so when developing any technology, it's really important to do beta testing. So let's say you create some app that's supposed to be used by your program staff to perhaps uh, intake clients on the go. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that when you program, let's say, that user interface, that you've designed uh, that user interface in a way that staff know what buttons to click, know where to input certain information, and are inserting it in a consistent way. Uh, and this cannot always be uh, kind of self-intuitive. A lot of the times, uh, if you're just sitting behind the desk and you haven't actually done uh, a lot of the intake, perhaps, that the staff is going to do, uh, it's really important to get their feedback and understanding exactly how things should move from, from A to B. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is have uh, a program launch or an app launch or website launch and then a year later find out that people uh, were basically just closing out or not using it for this particular type of problem just because they thought it didn't fit or the field they were supposed to put the information in they were actually putting it over here. Uh, and at that point it's going to be really difficult if not impossible to go back and try to fix all of the, uh, the errors. So definitely take your time and make sure that everybody who will be using the app uh, kind of is tested and, and you get feedback from them to see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, um, an example I have is if you are starting a new program that maybe uses community advocates or AmeriCorps members, for example, um, and you've trained them up. So they're not lawyers, you're training them to do some kind of assistance that supplements um, a legal pro assistance program you have, um, and you've trained them. And then you send them out into the world and they're doing, they're doing what you've trained them to, to do, or you assume they are. Um, you might follow up later and, and do client surveys to find out, you know, is it having an effect? And one thing you're not gonna know if you didn't do a process evaluation is are the people you trained to do some kind of assistance actually doing it the way you trained them to do it? Um, and so a really good thing to do is to check in periodically um, and either retrain um, the, the members or advocates or do some direct observations to make sure that they're still, that, that the training is still fresh enough in their memories, that they're doing what they were trained to do. Um, otherwise, you're gonna follow up on the outcomes and you might not see an effect and then assume that the program didn't work, but it was actually that they weren't doing what they were trained to do. Um, so that's an example of a process evaluation that, that is really important to know about. Okay. Economic benefits. Um, this is, I think, one that, that gets the most attention out there in the world, obviously because it's super helpful for gaining more funding. Um, but this answers the question of, you know, what are the economic benefits of the program compared to its costs? Is the program cost-effective and sustainable? Um, so these are return on investment analyses or economic impact analyses. 
uh, very effective in terms of just showing economic viability of a program, um, financial feasibility. Uh, so I wanna caution, put a word of caution out there about this and um, these are really, really difficult to do well, I think, because it's really, there's a lot of a focus on numbers and when it comes to like a human intervention, which is what legal services are, uh, it's really hard to capture that holistic understanding of what the benefits are. So I think it's, it's intuitive to all of us that some of these benefits are, there's a ripple effect, we, we think, we believe, um, and there's probably even a community effect, and there's probably some long-term effects on clients' lives in terms of their well-being, in terms of their family stability. Those are all things that are extremely difficult to capture in numbers and are often um, consequently left out of these analyses. Um, so, so that's just something to be aware of. There's also, um, a lot. if you look at the different economic benefits reports in different jurisdictions, they're not all the same, and yet you'll all often hear um, citations to, you know, at, for every dollar invested in legal aid in this state, the benefit was $11 or $4 or $6. Um, and that's really confusing, because, you know, there's so much variation. It's in part because of this difficulty in really quantifying things like this, and each of these analyses tends to do it in a slightly different way. So um, they're hard to they're hard to compare. And I will say with tech projects, always keep an eye out and reevaluate later on down the road, as a lot of tech projects sometimes have ancillary benefits that aren't anticipated in the beginning. So if you create some app that automates some process like expungement. Uh, check to see if other organizations, other legal service organizations, have started using that app, and then can you count that economic benefit? Are there now private attorneys using it? Are there pro se people who are using it? Uh, and so there's, there can be other economic benefits you don't necessarily anticipate as core related to your, uh, your group that might kind of present itself later on down the road. So always keep an eye on that. Cool, okay. Okay, so now we're scaling up to observational. Uh, this is, uh, an uh, assessment that addresses the question of, is my program associated with positive or negative outcomes for the clients? Um, again, I'm, I'm highlighting the word associated, and again, we'll get more into that, but, but observational method is really the idea, you may have heard of pre-post tests. Um, so it's, it's kind of looking at what is happening in an environment before and then after you've introduced a change to it. Um, this is really low cost to do um, because it generally relies on data that you already have out there um, in your administrative data sets or out in um, data sets that are in your, you know, online or in your jurisdiction. Um, so it doesn't necessarily require meddling with what your program is doing or bringing in outside researchers. Um, sometimes that's a, a really low cost way of looking at something. Um, so it's really effective for, for just showing some associations in terms of your program and possible outcomes. Uh, it does not give you causal data, and we're gonna get more into talking about what exactly that means, but, but that is one of its limitations. It, it's really hard to rule out other confounding factors. So let's draw some examples. Yeah. How do we get to the white screen? Let's see. <laughs> Okay, so this is, I'm gonna do a visual drawing of, I'm a very visual person, so, um, of a pre-post test. So I'm gonna use T. Yeah, pick a. Oh, red, yeah. T1, time one. So if you pick a time period um, before you've introduced a program or intervention. So let's say this is a year, one year, and then this is the time when you uh, you know, you implemented some new program or intervention, we'll just say program, whatever that is. Okay, so then you started there, and then here's time two. So let's say this is a year after you introduced your new program or tool or, or intervention. So that's kind of like a timeline of what that would look like. Um, so what you could do is look at data from over here so that's data from that might be in administrative data sets or in, that you may have collected through surveying or whatever approach you take. But you look at that data and then you look at the same kind of data during time period two. So we have an example. Yeah. An example. Yeah. So one example would be if 
let's say you work with the courts, you create some new self-help, uh, let's say bankruptcy guides or maybe debt collection guides, and you put them in the courthouse right outside the courtroom. And so that would be right here. So you go back and somehow you've collected all this data and for T1 here, uh, you've averaged out that the, the settlement rate for debt collection cases is $1,000 or maybe half of people you know, to, uh, settle and, and half don't. Uh, and then after you've implemented your program guide where you've passed them out to people, you've set it up on the stand somewhere outside the courthouse, you reanalyze the data and you say, oh, well, look, that's great. The average uh, settlement rate is now $800. So our guides have saved people on average $200 when they settle with their debt collector before uh, going to trial. Well, that is one possibility. However, there are a number of other possibilities that cause that problem. So one might be that legislation change uh, to make it harder to bring certain types of debt collection cases. And so the cases that are settling are perhaps ones that uh, didn't have a strong case prior to legislation. Maybe a debt collection ag agency went out of business uh, and so that group isn't bringing them anymore. Maybe another legal services agency has set up a pro bono shop uh, in that courthouse. So there's a number of factors that could have raised it. Uh, and, it's, uh, and so while your intervention might be something that is causing it, and maybe it's helping to a degree, uh, you can't really tell for certain that it is. Yeah, and so I would recommend, if you're going to do this kind of approach, um, it, you might be able to gather some, some useful information from it, but you wanna really sit down and think about what some of these other factors are, and this is where you know a formative assessment is really useful. You want to really get a sense of what's happening in your jurisdiction to understand if there's something else that's going on that might be causing the difference that you're observing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Back to the slides. Switching back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to technical errors. Okay, there we go. Quasi experimental. So this is. Um, a similar kind of question that we're getting at is does my program is it associated does it maybe cause some of these positive or negative outcomes for the clients recipients or users we're getting closer to causal now um, so the, the previous one was was more about association we're kind of moving towards the idea of, of really getting at some of the other factors that might be involved and isolating it to um, understand if the effect of the program itself um, so quasi experimental really focuses on looking at some of the natural things in the in your program that made us may have sorted people into a group that received the intervention versus a group that didn't within the same time period so in the previous one we were talking about two different time periods now we're looking at one time period but comparing people who got your program services to people who did not um, and there are things that happen just naturally in our environment that that create those kinds of groups. So you can look at, it's almost like a control group that's been created. So one example is eligibility cutoffs. Like all legal aid organizations have to turn people away, unfortunately, and there are different criteria for turning people away. So um, that does create a group of people that didn't receive the services, that had that need, came to legal services uh, for help, and then did not receive services. So you can look at what happened to those people compared to the people that you did help. Um, so this is getting more towards the causal, causal explanation about the program and the outcomes that you're observing. Um, but it is, it, the limitations are that, there, again, like with the observational, there are other factors involved that might have caused the outcomes you're observing. Um, and it can be really difficult to tease all those out. I think we can draw this. Can we draw this? I bet we can. <laughs> okay. So good at using that. Okay. Um, so let's say. Okay. So these are these are people, uh, and they have come to. That's the door of legal services. Okay. And so they come in, and you have limited resources. So you turn some of them away. So some of them you're like, sorry. And they end up over here. And then some of these people, you are able to help. Um, and so what would that look like? What's a, what's a, here, so this is, this is some self-help materials and this is, uh, I'm gonna put glasses on this person to represent that they're a lawyer. <laughs> okay, so 
these these people came over here and they got help. These people got turned away because of eligibility cutoffs, because of um, other LSC requirements that that have turned them away, because of uh, you know limited resources, because of conflicts checks. There are all kinds of reasons that they might be turned away. Um, and then what you do is you follow up and you measure outcomes. Yes. And then you compare these, right? And so you might see like, oh, these people are doing much better, um, or they've like gotten through the legal system better than those people. And then you might think that it was due to this guy with the glasses here. Um, but what you're similar to the observation methodology, you're going to want to consider what the differences are between these people and well, these are the people being helped. My stick figures are getting worse and worse. Okay. So you want to really think about what the differences are between these two populations. So, uh, Matthew, what would be like one, one thing that would make this group different from this group? Yeah, sure. So one requirement that a lot of, uh, legal services groups has is that they can't help, uh, people who are not U.S. citizens. And so does a group uh, that unfortunately are not U.S. citizens, do they have different legal issues or some kind of difference on average than the group that are U.S. citizens? And so comparing those two is going to cause uh, not a perfect alignment. Yeah, they may have uh, different access to resources. Um, there might be different resources in their environment or fewer resources in their environment that would make them look different from this group. Um, another thing that, that is really common for turning people away is because they're over income, right? So these people might actually have more money than these people, right? Um, and so that actually could definitely have an effect on, on the outcomes you're observing. So it's a similar kind of problem to the observational where you want to be really careful if you're going to do this, um, you're going to wanna make sure that you're thinking about these other factors so maybe what you want to do is um, use as your comparison group people that, that you would imagine would be very similar to this group. Um, so screening out the over-income people. Maybe there you have a program. There's a program um, that we're looking at evaluating that has um, four slots per day for private housing cases. And so one, if someone comes in and it's the fourth person who has that issue, they take that client. If, the if there's a fifth person that comes in in a given day, they just can't take that client. And there'd be no reason to think that that fourth person is different from that fifth person or the sixth or seventh person. So in that case, if you know their incomes might be very similar, they may be otherwise very similarly situated, there is a, all these people are eligible in the same way, um, but they just didn't get service because of, they came in at one o'clock, one person came in at one o'clock versus the other person coming in at three o'clock. So that could be a better way of going about creating a group of people you follow up on and make comparisons to. I guess there could be differences between people who come in later in the day versus earlier in the day. Yeah, That's people with cars versus people public Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all things to think about. Um, so that's kind of the limitation of this approach, but it still is, is getting you more towards um, looking at comparisons as opposed to just looking at these people and looking at their outcomes. You don't know how that compares to other people or, you know, how it would have compared if they hadn't gotten help. Um, so it's really important to think about that idea of your program's um, effectiveness with regard to the people they did help versus what would have happened if those people had not gotten the help. And this is especially true with technology too. There are different groups of people that uh, do not adapt to technology as fast or as easily as other groups. And so if you build a website or an app or some great virtual reality program, uh, you have to make sure that you're not just comparing people who are able and under to download a mobile app and understand how to use a mobile app quickly and are uh, comfortable with that versus a group that maybe don't have smartphones, don't understand how apps work, um, as those two groups may have a lot of differences between them uh, in their legal issues. Yeah, so that's a good point. In this in this example, it is the selection of the legal aid organization. What you're talking about is self-selection. So you know, like this guy might have a cell phone. That's a cell phone. Um, versus this guy does not have a cell phone. Maybe he has a walkie-talkie. I don't know. Um, so that's going to be self-selection. Uh, instead of a door, it would just be the, the app. Um, this, this guy is going to be able to access it. This guy doesn't have a cell phone or chooses to not have a cell phone and therefore can't access some app online. Um, and those are, 
naturally going to be differences between those people. All right. Okay. How do we get back? Hold up. Yes. Okay. Now we're getting to the category of experimental. So this is answering the question, or getting us at least much closer to the idea, does my program cause the positive or negative outcomes that we're observing? Um, again, moving away from associations to causal, trying to screen out all those other factors that we've been talking about and drawing on the board. Um, this is the method that the A to J lab does, so we have a lot to say about it. We'll try to be concise, so. Uh, so we do randomized controlled trials. Um, that's what the, the methodology is called that we use. And this is one, this is an approach that formally assigns people to one of those groups versus the other. So it doesn't always have to be a, an assignment to receiving a service versus no service at all. It could be assignment to um, receiving a non-legal assistant, non-legal assistance like a community advocate or AmeriCorps member versus a pro bono attorney or um, a non-lawyer assistant versus self-help materials. So, so that's, it depends on what you're trying to look at and what question you're trying to answer, but it, it will take a group of people that are similar, that have the same eligibility, uh, like a pool of people that have the same kind of criteria that, it, that has been met, and then randomly assigns them to one type of intervention versus another. So that's the gist of it. It's actually a very simple methodology. It uses, instead of the word random, you could think they use the use of the word lottery. So basically like, few people come to, come into a, to receive services, they're all similar in terms of their um, eligibility, and then you just flip a coin and you say you get a pro bono attorney versus you get a community advocate, or you'll receive help via this technology tool versus you will receive help versus um, you know paper assistance. Um, and then what you can do is follow up on those outcomes. Uh, effectiveness, again, we're getting at really close to the idea of causal. Um, limitations, again, um, can't control humans, and so if you give someone a pro bono attorney, they may then go out and, and do some, you know, get other kinds of assistance. If you give someone self-help materials, uh, they may also find assistance elsewhere. So you can't always control what's happening. Um, so those are just kinds of things that you need to think about. It's also resource intensive, and this is typically you're going to do a big randomized control trial, you might need to partner with a researcher out there to make that happen. But not always, because A-B testing is, is an RCT, and that is something that happens all the time in the technology world. It, things as simple as um, sending out emails and figuring out what kind of messaging for the subject line is the best. There are, there are email tools that will like test that out, right? That is a, a randomized control trial, so it's not always a big uh, complicated project it can be something really simple as like trying out different messaging to see what um, resonates with people and what results in better responses I think we could draw this out too right? okay so we'll start with our people again Okay, so our people have a legal problem. They've come to the door of, of a legal aid program or to a courthouse or whatever. Um, so they have the same legal problem. They come here uh, and then it is determined, okay, so maybe some of them, they're all, they're all eligible. Let's say they're all similarly situated kinds of people. They have the same general, they're in the poverty population. They have the same kind of legal problem. They're similar kinds of people um, and then you flip a coin. This is a coin. That's a head. That's a coin. Okay. Uh, so you flip a coin, and some of these people get uh, what example do we want to use? What's a good one? Self help materials. Okay. So self help materials. This would be a packet or a brochure or a binder of information or some kind of okay. program that a pro se person could use on their own. Okay, and then so some some people randomly get assigned to get those materials. The other group of people randomly get assigned to what do we want to do? Full staff attorney representation. Full rep. This way I get to draw this guy again. Um, okay, so those are two different conditions we've randomly assigned the people to. 
these people are then similar um, in that they are eligible for services, they, um, they all have the same kind of problem, so there would be no reason to believe that there's something else going on like what we were discussing on the previous slide about their different incomes or their self-selection um, issues. And there may be differences, but in the overall in the two groups, those differences will even out. Yeah. Um, and then just like, just like on the previous slide, you follow up on the outcomes and you observe the difference between these two groups of people. It doesn't always have to be a coin flip, but there are other ways of randomizing. There are lots of ways of randomizing. <laughs> so there are algorithms that computers create to, to produce random numbers, zeros and ones, to assign to one, from one group to another. What else? Uh, in the past, we've used case numbers to randomize. So maybe somebody has an odd number, uh, case number, and or an even number case number, and that's how staff can quickly decide which group goes into which. Uh, it's just always important to remember that whatever you're randomizing it on needs to be truly random. Uh, if, if you're randomizing it on something like the color of someone's hair, that could have some kind of ancillary effect that we don't quite fully comprehend. Okay, uh, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so we, I've talked a lot about the idea of association versus causation. Um, let's just talk a little bit more about this and why this distinction is really important. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, there are a number of studies out there on lawyers in delinquency, juvenile delinquency proceedings. These are non-randomized control studies. So these are different methodologies that are not um, in involving that randomization. Seven of those studies showed an increased likelihood of incarceration when a lawyer was assigned to a delinquency case. Five of them showed no effect. Um, so the question is, what do we gather from this? Do you believe that um, based on these, this research, it would suggest that giving a lawyer to a juvenile in a delinquency proceeding would make it more likely that they would end up incarcerated? Do we believe that? Does that seem right? It doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right to me. Yeah, um, is there a, here we go. Okay, so that's the question. Is, is that the conclusion we would come to? Um, every time I've brought this up to, or presented this example in the A to J field, everyone right away gets it. They're all like, well, obviously, um, the cases that are more serious, that are already more likely to result in incarceration are the ones that are more likely to get an attorney. So there's some selection there and triage that's happening, really. Um, and so that actually could explain the result. So that is a finding that you can have out there in research if you're not doing that randomization process. Um, I think that this also illustrates the importance of our field, the access to justice field, kind of um, educating researchers on what's happening and also on researchers educating um, the access to justice field on these different methodologies. I think it really needs to go both ways so that we don't end up with a series of research studies like that, um, we really need to be talking to each other across these fields. Okay, so this is this is just funny. I found this on the internet um, on whatever that, no, it doesn't say down there. Okay, I can't cite to it. I found it on the internet. Um, but this is actual data on number of people who drowned by falling into a pool, that's this red line here, uh, correlated with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. That's the black line. Uh, and they look really similar, right? So like, these are moving, this is, okay, this is timeline, 1999 to 2009. So over this 10 year period, this is what those two strings of data look like. Do we think there's a relationship there? My guess is probably not. My guess is not. I, I mean, I did, I did present this slide at some point and someone was like, I don't know, there could be, <laughs> there could be an actual causal relationship there. Um, my guess is not, but these are, things that happen in the world, that there can just, because of other factors or because of just the randomness of the world, you can end up seeing strings of data that look very similar. And we don't necessarily always want to assume that one of these caused the other, because then you end up with some really goofy things like this. Okay, we're reiterating some of the takeaways. So know what question you're trying to answer. Um, I think sometimes 
what we end up seeing is people think that they're answering the question about whether their intervention has caused an outcome when they're actually answering the question of whether an intervention is associated with an outcome. So being really clear um, about the methodology you're using and how it matches up with the question you think you're answering is important. And, um, and, and it's, certainly, it's certainly fine to do different kinds of methodologies, but then when you present your findings or when you draw conclusions or make program or policy changes based on those, just be really clear about what those limitations are and what you can and can't know based on those methodologies. Um, again, consider using more than one type of evaluation. There's, if you really wanna have a holistic understanding of your program and what it's doing and how it can be done better, um, combining different, different evaluations is really important. Um, again, be aware of the limitations of each approach. I think I already covered that first bullet point and and again plan your evaluation early uh, you want to just make sure that you're thinking through all the things that the data that you need to be collecting or documenting because you can't analyze data later that isn't there right, right. it's easy to fall into the trap of creating some intervention that has the goal of helping people but if you follow these steps you're more likely to define exactly what that means are you trying to lower the amount of uh, defendants who go to trial? Are you trying to lower the average settlement rate? Are you trying to increase the number of um, a, you know, particular type of hearing? And it's really important to come up with these questions uh, at this stage. Oh, I did it one at a time. Sorry, that's really <laughs> painful. Okay, there are more, there are more. <laughs> if you want to contact us, uh, we are findable via the a to jlab.org website. Um, we have email addresses and we are also all on Twitter. The A to J Lab handle is A to J, is just A to J Lab on Twitter. Um, so thank you and let us know if you have any questions. And we're at lots of conferences. Please feel free to, to kind of find us and pull us aside and ask us more about evaluations or research.